And welcome to a special bonus episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And longtime listeners might recall that a few months ago, we had a special bonus episode right at the beginning of the social isolation related to COVID and coronavirus, where we spoke with a few interesting people about how the stay-at-home orders were affecting them and how it was affecting their reading. And we thought, well, now that social isolation is relaxing, we might try it again. And then a lot of protests against police violence started happening. And that seemed to change the tenor of the mood as well. And we thought maybe we would talk with people and get another snapshot of how things are for them right now. People seem to be in a very different headspace from the last time we got together with a few people to chat about how they are. People then, I think, seem very kind of inwardly turned and thinking about their own spaces and how to organize their lives and their time. Now people seem to be looking outward. And that, I think, is really exciting. Yes. Uh, But let's just get right to it. Let's stop our yammering and let's let our guests talk. Who is the first person we spoke with? Our first guest is Carissa Harris. She teaches medieval literature at Temple University in Philadelphia. Her research and writing focus on obscenity, rape, and consent, medieval gender and sexuality, and long histories of rape culture and misogynoir. Her favorite medieval book is The Book of Marjorie Kemp, after whom her cat is named. Carissa, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? That is a good question. I am very, I'm very tired. I'm very tired. It's more than physical tired though, isn't it? Yeah, no, I'm I'm tired in my spirit. Um, And I was reading Cord Whitaker's interview with the IAS yesterday. And I I felt very validated that he articulated that same sentiment of just kind of Black people's deep, deep exhaustion right now, mm-hmm. uh, which is something that I've I've been telling people since they started checking in on me after the George Floyd video was released. People asked how I was doing. And I just said, you know, I'm very sad, but most of all, I'm just very, very tired. On top of COVID and everything else that's been yeah, going on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And working from home. And the way people are feeling that in their individual lives. I mean, there's so many layers to what's been happening. It seems like 2020 has been going on for like a decade now. Oh, I know. I think it's a very layered experience for us that we're going to be unpacking for some time to come. I hope with good things at the end of it. I do too. I do too. I do have some little hope amidst all that fatigue, but yeah, I was already very tired from the pandemic and from, you know, finishing the semester and, you know, being present for my students who are, you know, a lot of them were essential workers and were dealing with a lot and had friends and family members who were hospitalized with COVID. And then after that was finally over, then did this on top of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm tired. And I think those of us teaching in the spring term where there was that sudden move to online, and as you were just saying, caring for your students, supporting them, not just academically, but as human beings, um, you kind of end up putting yourself last. Yeah. You know, and I, I wanted them all to succeed and I wanted them to be able to complete their work. And I wanted, I was, I was constantly struggling to figure out how I could support them best and be most flexible while also making sure that everything got done in the end so that everyone could pass. And so that, that took up a lot of, a lot of energy and space. And the reading you were doing was reading their work and reading the things that the work stuff, I suppose. Yeah. Although I did start once the pandemic hit and once we were online constantly, Uh, I forced myself to read for a space of time before bed every night, which is a practice that I've always loved doing, but kind of have gotten away from since I started teaching. And so after, you know, once, once we were on screens constantly, I, I needed to read just to give myself a break and also to unplug from the news and from social media, just because it was, it was not helping my stress levels to be lying in bed, scrolling my phone and seeing all the horrible articles about how we're all going to die. Um, so I, I put away the phone before bed and I brought a stack of books onto my nightstand and I, I started reading then. So that has been very, very restorative. Some people have been talking about returning to books from their past and others have been talking about reading things that are new and fresh and mm-hmm. push them in different directions. And I was wondering which one of those or both have been on your mind. I've been doing both, to be honest. Uh, in, in the last couple of weeks in particular, I decided that I was only going to read Black women, uh, with the exception of R. Eric Thomas, who's a queer Black man. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've been reading lots of Black women. I've been reading Bell Hooks' work on uh, on pedagogy. 
I've been reading Paula Giddings's comprehensive, super long biography of Ida B. Wells. Uh, I returned to Audre Lorde's A Burst of Light and other essays, which I've read before, I've underlined and annotated, but that has been really refreshing and sustaining to read that. Um, and also Camille Acker's short story collection, Training School for Negro Girls. I've been returning to that as well. More nonfiction than fiction, it sounds like? or That's a good question. I, I like fiction. Uh, I was actually a fiction writing minor uh, in undergrad. Uh, but I find myself usually reading more nonfiction than fiction. Uh, and when I do read fiction, I usually read short stories because those are digestible. You can read them before bed. Uh, and I don't stick because otherwise I will stay up for hours reading a novel. <laughs> That's the problem. And I can't do that because I need my sleep. So short story collections are ideal because then I can just read one and then go to bed. So the semester, is the semester over for you at this it point? It is over. I filed grades on May 9th. They are done. Oh, okay. So it's been over for a little while now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that means you haven't been in contact with students while uh, things have been setting off lately. No, although I did see a photo of a student uh, in our local newspaper at a protest carrying a, a sign with a Malcolm X quote. So I emailed the student and was like, hey, I saw you. Hope you're doing well. Um, but otherwise, no, I haven't had contact with students since all of this. And if I were teaching, we would definitely be talking about this uh, and students would be, you know, we would also be discussing historical roots uh, of anti-Blackness and racism, which we typically do in my classes, especially in the, the British Literary Survey class. Uh, we typically read The Mask of Blackness, The Irish Mask at Court, uh, Queen Elizabeth's Edicts, expelling Black, you know, symbolically expelling Black people from her realm. And we read about English anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages. And so all of that is really useful for students to make sense of what's happening now. Um, but since the semester is over, I, I think it would be even more exhausting if I were teaching while doing this, just because it takes a lot of emotional work to be present and be engaged and to kind of talk through students' feelings and my feelings and everything. I'm sure you've had this experience before where you've been teaching a subject and the news has caught up with it, let's say, yes. uh, or it's felt extremely relevant. I, I guess you could have two or maybe more feelings about that, but it could be either really exhausting because you're thinking about it and then you're thinking about it harder and then you're dealing with it and dealing with other people's emotions around it. Or is it cathartic to have that space where you can focus your frustrations about the news? It can be useful. I mean, I, I remember in early December of 2014, uh, when uh, it came down that there'd be no charges uh, against the officer who killed Michael Brown. And that was also when the Eric Garner video was circulating really prominently. I did talk to my students explicitly um, about those events. And it was really great to hear their thoughts and to hear them, have them listen to each other. Because one of the things I love about teaching where I teach is that my students come from a range of perspectives and backgrounds and uh, and experiences, uh, places in their lives, their range of ages, professions. A lot of them are parents uh, or caregivers. And so it felt very good to be able to facilitate conversations with them about that because they wanted to talk about that stuff. Um, and then after Walter Scott was shot by police in, I believe it was early 2015, when that video surfaced, uh, again, I was it was right before I was teaching about medieval English histories of race uh, and anti-Semitism. So when I before we talked about Elizabeth's edicts uh, and the Mask of Blackness, we talked about the Walter Scott video, um, and then I think Freddie Gray was right after that. So I do I do bring that into the classroom when it's happening while I'm teaching, and often the timing is really fortuitous, not in well, a good way. Yeah. <laughs> that's perhaps the wrong word. I mean, if it's if it keeps happening, then it's I guess it's always yeah. going to happen eventually at the yeah. at the quote unquote right time. This is that tiredness, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that people keep saying, I never learned about this. I didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. Like there's an attentiveness to I want to say hidden histories, but it's, it's, that's not the right word for it. Um, histories that are being made visible in a more deliberate way now. So somebody would say, I didn't know about Juneteenth until, I don't know, a few years ago, or I didn't know about the Tulsa race massacre until, you know, whatever. And and so th the histories are sort of there and not there. And so I, there seems to be this attentiveness to like reading with purpose, you know, reading to learn. Yes. And to pass it on. Yes. 
Yeah. And that reflects my own experience of reading, you know, from when I was a kid, the highlight, you know, I was homeschooled for a long time. The highlight of my week was when we went to the library every Mm. Wednesday Mm -hmm. um, and I would get like 30 books (laughs) uh, Mm -hmm. from all different sections of the library, from the biography section, from the history section. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Holocaust section, (laughs) the geography section, you know, I'd bring them all home and I'd just like throw them on my bed and just kind of like roll around and read little bits from each book. Uh, But I've always really, really been into reading to learn. You know, I also read for pleasure, but I, I've always really enjoyed learning things from what I read and being edified. And that was one of the things that just blew my mind when I went to college for the first time was that we were expected to learn and to research and to learn about things that we were interested in. We had choice in the classes we could take and the topics we could learn more about. You guys intoxicating, right? It was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> and it, it just blew my mind. And that was why I decided to become a professor because I couldn't think of anything that would bring me more joy than to be always learning things and reading things and talking about things with other people who had also read those things. You know, coming back to the reading that we're doing in the present time, one of the things that's been on my mind, and I, I imagine other people's mind too, is that on the one hand, it feels like we're in a crisis, a turning point, a, a complicated moment that has some hope in it. And yet also it's a long haul, right? And when you were talking before about being tired, it makes me think about people, you know, maintaining their desire for change, maintaining their willingness to learn and teach and act and move forward over time. And for some people, this is something that they've known for a long time and they're they're doing it, you know, doing what they can. For others, it's very new. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent, you know, the ways which we read alone and also read together and read mindfully, but also read, you know, in a self-care, nurturing kind of way. I wonder how that can support that shared drive toward a better time. Yeah, no, that's, you know, I always am reading multiple things at once. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't just read one book. I have to, I'm usually reading like three to five books at any given moment. Yeah, I'm the same. (laughs) Um, Just because, you know, sometimes I'm in the mood for one thing, sometimes for another, and it keeps me from getting bored. But uh, one of the things I think is really important for kind of keep, you know, I'm going to be tired for a while, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but but for keeping that learning and that that drive is to kind of curate uh, kind of a a reading diet that has some things for pleasure, some things for edification, uh, you know, some poetry, you know, if you're into poetry, some nonfiction, you know, stuff from different time periods. I find that to be kind of helpful and sustaining. So you're not just being bombarded with, you know, like all information about all the racism ever right now. (laughs) Um, Although for me, in my case, I I feel very grateful that my father was very committed to having us learn about black history and learning, not just about the struggle and, you know, about the Scottsboro boys and about Emmett Till, um, but also really affirming stories like Sojourner Truth, Marian Anderson, uh, Madam C.J. Walker. And so since I was a kid, I've been both focused on, you know, learning about histories of trauma and of injustice, but also of resilience and continuing to persist and to excel, you know, alongside that. And that kind of created a model for me that I've, I, I think I've been able to carry forward. Our second guest is Allison Kinney, whose first book of cultural history, Hood, was published by Bloomsbury's Object Lessons series in 2016. She's written online and or for print at The New Yorker, The Paris Review Daily, Harper's, Laffin's Quarterly, Long Reads, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, The Believer, and several other publications, and has had four notable essays in the Best American Essays from 2016 through to 2019. Allison has taught nonfiction writing at the New School and at Catapult since 2017, and was hired in 2019 as an assistant professor of writing at Eugene Lang College. Hello, Allison. Thank you for joining us. It's great to talk with you. It's great to talk with you. Thank you. So how has the world been treating you lately? <laughs> the world has been treating me okay. And it, it, it's a strange question. Um, I wrote an essay recently for a website, howweare.org, that Nicole Walker is an editor for, um, asking the question, how, how, how are you? How are we? And with, with writers and artists and musicians responding. And I was very evasive in my reply because I'm fine. I'm really, really (laughs) fine. And how I am right now does not really feel that important to me. Mm. Um, But it's an interesting question. 
And I, there are so many ways in which just asking the question takes us to different places. It opens up experiences and it does open up so many people's lives. And it's, I feel it's really necessary. But for me, I kind of feel like I don't need to be asked. <laughs> Well, it's become a real question, hasn't it? For the longest time, it wasn't a real question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's no longer a placeholder, but I guess sometimes it still does function as a placeholder for people who can't talk about mm. how things are or you know, don't feel safe with that or can't have that conversation in that moment with, with such and such a person. And Allison, you've been in, in New York all this time, and that's been a very particular kind of experience or particular kinds of experiences, maybe, depending on where people are positioned geographically, where they're positioned socially, how engaged they are in the political action. How has that experience played out for you? Oh, gosh, that's such a huge question. I know. Um, (laughs) Well, I think that starting out thinking about the pandemic and being well, and most of my, the people who are very close to me were also well, so that was that was such a luxury to be able to enjoy. Um, one of the things I, I I knew as a New Yorker and also as a Brooklyner who lives in a majority black neighborhood was that from the very start, the ways that COVID-19 was working out in New York City had a lot to do with inequities. Mm-hmm. And that was very apparent very early on, um, mm-hmm. especially with who was being required to to do essential work, who had to go out into public, who was not able to quarantine, what were the housing situations and what was the access to medical care. Mm-hmm. Um, because right away we started hearing stories about um, people who are black and who were not being treated mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. were being you know, rejected from emergency rooms. And, and not picked up by ambulances and things like that. Yeah. yeah. And so... And a lot of the, and, and also I live in a neighborhood that is majority black and um, my neighbors are healthcare workers. Mm. So that, that is something I was, that was very obvious to me just from the neighborhood, even before I started seeing coverage of it in the news. Mm. So the fact that the recent awareness of these incidents of extreme police violence and murder has come during the pandemic, it wasn't surprising. Mm. It was something that was all wrapped up in the same in the same issues of systemic inequality. And so when people started saying that the pandemic is about racism mm-hmm. and that um, white supremacy is a disease, all of these all of these um, political thoughts seem to me to have been very, very present from the start. Um, yeah, it wasn't like two things. It was a continuation. Yeah, of the, yeah, of yeah, the other, of the first yeah. Thing, yeah. Since from the very start, we'd been talking a lot about um, racism and how it worked its way through the pandemic in mm-hmm. policy and response. Um, it, it seemed very, from the start to, to be all one thing. Mm-hmm. And with that said, you know, like I was saying, my life is, is very fortunate and very privileged. And so being able to be a bystander mm-hmm. or to be to engage in protest and to have the energy for it and to engage in the conversations is also such a luxury mm-hmm. because I am not someone who's high risk of, of police brutality or mm-hmm. systemic racism or the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And having the, the freedom to be able to consider these things with, um, with attention and with not being constantly triggered by it. Mm-hmm. It's such a luxury that so many friends of mine don't have. Mm-hmm. And so there are ways in which I feel like close engagement to the point of exhaustion with the issues, with the politics and with the protests is a requirement for those of us who have the health and the position yeah. to be able to do so. In this time when so much is going on and there's this obligation, as you say rightly, to, to be there and to be present and to be active, right? Those who can should be there. Um, how you have to take care of yourself too, right? There's the, there's the truth and the, you know, you have to put on your own mask before you help someone else, right? You have to nourish yourself in certain ways. Um, how has that worked for you? How do you refill the well? You know, something that I started thinking about a lot at the start of the shutdown in New York was that the past two years for me were pretty hard. Mm. And I had a lot of trauma. I had a lot of issues with money and work and just trying to get by. And, and during that time, I, I did a lot of reading on chronic illness mm-hmm. and coping mechanisms and and getting by when one has depression and also a lot of physical ailments and a lot of pain. And so during that time, I concentrated very hard on 
just getting through the necessary things each day and not beating myself up when none of them could be met. And so I have, I'm a very low energy person and I have depression and I concentrate every day on just getting through one or two things. Mm -hmm. So by the time the national catastrophe that we're in began, I was, I was very fortunate to have a full-time job, to have a new apartment that I owned and to have set up my life in a way that was Mm -hmm extraordinary compared to the past few years and just extraordinary compared to most people's lives. And I'm ready in some sense. Yeah. I was, and so everything had smoothed out for me and I'd also gained all of these coping skills or, or coping skills, but also coping mechanisms for, mm-hmm. you know, when everything is now set up to be good in your life, but you still are traumatized and mm-hmm. still are, are struggling to get through your two things every day. Um, I, I I had that focus though to enable me to get through it, and so by the time this happened, I would you know I, I I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I think that having that focus on illness for a long time and just surviving mm-hmm. put me in a good state to to think about what is needful mm-hmm. and what are the ways in which what I do for relaxing or to get by, like to not be judgmental about how I cope with it myself, but also to try to think outward in terms of self-care. You know, like when Audre Lorde formulated the idea of self-care, it was as a radical act mm-hmm. for Black women. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and so this, and when I think about self-care, I try to think, you know, if, if I go outside, if I'm seeking some kind of pleasure, if I'm, if I'm reaching out to other people, am I doing it in a way that doesn't cause more harm? Mm-hmm. And am I doing it in a way that could potentially, you know, bring me pleasure, but also do something for somebody else and to not take up more oxygen than mm-hmm. is necessary? I, this is kind of a ramble. But no, I no, I, I'm so moved by what you're saying about doing what is needful. And I feel like for many of us, we're taking stock of that. You know, what do we really need, right? And that plays out in terms of consumer things, but also how we shape our lives and the things we do and the extent to which we impinge upon others and the extent to which we beat up or don't beat up on ourselves, right? Like you were saying, you were describing being in a place where you might have two things that you can get done and that's okay. And even if those two things don't get done, you know, that's okay too. Um, One of the things I've noticed over these past few months, uh, you know, I'm somebody who tends to put my to-do list in my phone, right? So I'll put it sort of like put it, uh, I'll throw into the calendar stuff that has to get done on particular days. And my calendar got pretty complicated, right? And once this all started, I became paralyzed. I could not do any of that anymore. So I started keeping a kind of a handwritten notebook where I'd put the date at the top, day of the week, because I pretty quickly found I had no idea what day of the week it was anymore, right? Um, Like many of us. And and I'd put down things that I wanted to get done. And sometimes it was way over ambitious. And sometimes it was just one or two things. And like, that was a lifeline. I mean, again, I'm not complaining Mm -hmm. at all. Like, I don't think I've had a hard time. But like, I'm very conscious of being privileged in the ways you were talking about. Um, but it's been hard even so emotionally at certain moments, especially when a lot of your mental energy goes to take care of other people. Um, and so, so that, that whole point about like putting down two things and letting that be all you're responsible for and forgiving yourself. I have some days where I've written down, like, I have no idea what happened on that day. (laughs) You know, I don't, I don't know what happened to it. Um, but not being angry with yourself, which I would have been before. Yeah, I think that there's a lot to be learned from the chronic illness community about yeah. about care and about not, you know, there's been so much talk in academic circles about the the capitalist narrative of productivity mm. and how it is something that is going to be used to bludgeon people now mm-hmm. um, for not being productive at times when they're just trying to get by and survive. And our homes have been turned into our workplaces. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I really reject that. And I think that the illness community give us, gives us a lot of ways of talking about that as a destructive narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, but I also, I also think that there are ways that I, because I have this good fortune, can think about caring and think about, um, about survival in ways that can be communitarian. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to think about how, you know, I, I'm, I'm also saying this as a person who has watched Groundhog Day 86 mm. times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and like everybody you seem to be talking to, I'm also reading The Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and I, I spend a lot of time at night in the bubble in, in my bathtub <laughs> with lavender oil just oh. trying to chill out and read. Um but, you know, that we, we strengthen ourselves sometimes with yoga or with baths or with eating something delicious to, to think that when we go out there, when we do re- reconnect, there are mm-hmm. things that we can do that can make things better for other people, too. And, and sometimes it's reaching out to a friend and sometimes it's a protest. And there are there are so many ways in which we can. I, I, I think that when we are fortunate enough and healthy enough, we can think about ways to make our healing and our pleasure part of the community good as well. Yeah, to make ourselves stronger and able to do more for others and with others, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've started riding the subway for the first time since March in order Mm -hmm. to get to and from protests in Manhattan when I sometimes go there. Mm -hmm. And what I'm reading on the subway is Colson Whitehead Zone 1. Oh, Mm -hmm. Which I, I have either of you read that? No. No, I've got I've got a stack of Colson Whitehead <laughs> that I've been meaning to read, but you know. <laughs> so I, I love Whitehead and Zone One was was a book I read uh, several years ago and I read it in a single sitting. It was so riveting. And uh, then I but I'm not a very retentive or smart reader. And so I have to read books a second time in order to make them stick. And zone one is about a pandemic that hits hits the world and hits New York and it's being narrated through the perspective it's being told about a member of a sweeper crew in lower Manhattan who's living at a fort in Chinatown um, after the zombie apocalypse Mm. and it's a very violent book and it's very reflective and the really important thing to know about the survivor of the apocalypse one of the people who is holding on and surviving and just trying to think about what life means in the afterwards is a 30 ish black man Mm -hmm. Mm. and he who, who has survived by learning how to be invisible in all the right ways. Oh, wow. Mm. And so it's it's this incredible, incredible zombie book, pandemic book, and mm-hmm. commentary on Invisible Man. It's it's mm-hmm. all of these things at once. And so in thinking about how we survive and how we be our best selves and how we just get through anything at all, it's 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 incredible reading. It's also very violent, and it's it's for all the reasons that are obvious. It's very triggering, and so I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. But I find that so many of his observations about race and gender and illness and survival and violence and white supremacy and how you rebuild a government when mm-hmm. everything has been destroyed, it's really, it's really powerful, really that pertinent. That sounds amazing. Our third guest is Simone de Rochefort. She's a senior video producer at video games website Polygon, and she's one of the hosts of the tech podcast Rocket on Relay FM. She's also a notorious Hemingway aficionado, and you may remember she joined us for our bonus episode after we read Hemingway's A Movable Feast. Hello, Simone, and thank you for joining us once again. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me back. Um, I am doing fine. All things considered, I think I'm doing pretty great. (laughs) How about you? (laughs) A lot of people are doing worse than me, let's put it that way. Yes. How have you been keeping busy while you've been presumably stuck at home? I mean, you've been working. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Here, Here's my concern. I think that I am going completely feral. <laughs> and there's going to come a time now when we can like go out and hang out with people and travel to see people. And I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> have, have, the, have the protests and such made a lot of impact in your neighborhood? I, I'm not sure I would say impact as in like frenzied activity, but there have certainly been, been like demonstrations in my neighborhood, which is wonderful because I will not travel. 
Um, but we have <laughs> the Cathedral of St. John the Divine uh, near me. And they had a, a gathering there that was a vigil that then walked uptown from there. And so many people came out and it was the first time I've been around that many people in many, many months. Uh, and it didn't strike me as weird until I was in the middle of it. And then I was like, whoa, wow, that, that's right. This is the first time that I've seen more than probably 10 people at a time since March. How odd. Um, but the energy has been very good. And again, like most people I've seen have been behaving super safely and wearing their masks and everything, except for the loud joggers in Central Park. But, you know, <laughs> they're running. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, I mean... It seems like you're not supposed to wear your mask while you're jogging or exercising. Yeah, but... I think I've heard that that's okay because you're moving. I'm not a doctor. Hey, <laughs> don't listen to me. <laughs> I also, I'm not a jogger. <laughs> Guess what? I'm not running. I'm doing at home yoga. <laughs> that's also good. Yes. So have you been getting a lot of reading done during the pandemic, during the during these exciting times? You know what? I have. <laughs> So I fall in the camp of people who apparently can read during a time of social unrest. <laughs> have you been reading more than usual then? Uh, I have some statistics, as I think I mentioned when we were talking about this. <laughs> so, okay, so I started tracking my reading lists because I bullet journal a lot, I think maybe three years ago. And I've tried to hover around like 40 books. And last year I, so the year before I had done amazingly, I'd gotten to like 60 and this was nuts for me. Cause I think as we mentioned last time I was on the show, I stopped reading for a while after college, mm -hmm. but I really, I hit my stride 60 books. Amazing. So the next year I said, well, okay, I'll make my goal 50. That should be a breeze and cut to Christmas of 2019 and I am cramming boxcar children books down my throat because I am like 10 books behind. That's artificially inflating your numbers. I know. <laughs> it's totally legitimate. I, that's what I used poetry chat books for back in the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I made this graph because I was curious of the genres of books that I read. And in that year, and only that year, there's this huge chunk that says children's. And it is valid. <laughs> However, it is also cheating. <laughs> um, but this year, I just hit 40 this week. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm impressed with myself. So what what kinds of things are you reading? Like some people are reading more like, I want to say politically oriented things, but which I mean, you know, things that are reflecting on where we are and where we might go. Mm. Is that stuff you're reading? Or are you reading very different kinds of stuff? Well, Suzanne... <laughs> I'm reading murder mysteries. Those are also important. Which ones? Uh, so I've been taking a nostalgia trip. I decided that since I had been revisiting a lot of familiar Agatha Christie books, mm. that I wanted to read her entire canon. Yes. I love oh, her so much. That's a lot Good of books. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> are you reading in order? No, because I had started, you know, with some of the ones from the 30s and 40s mm. that I had read as a kid or a teen, I guess. Um, but then I did go back to some of those very, very early ones. I actually, the first book I read this year was death on the Nile. So that was a revisitation of a classic. Um, but then I read less, uh, less popular things like the big four, which was an absolute mess. That's such <laughs> a good one. It's so, er it's like, it was so early and so crazy, <laughs> right? It's like, you know, super villains. Oh, it's wild. You know? it's like, yes. Absolute super villains. Dr. Evil type characters. It, it, it takes so much denial of a, what, what, sorry, what is that called? Um, S suspension of disbelief. Suspension uh, of disbelief. Thank uh -huh, you. Uh -huh. Because there's these four incredible murderers. Yeah. Yeah. One of which who can kill anyone. Do you remember the part where Hercule Poirot has a cigarette and he um, threatens one of the criminals? This is toward the end that he will, like, you know, kill them with his, like, a dart. Like, I have a dart or a poison dart or something in my dart cigarette. cigarette. Yes, yes. Oh, and she loves her poison darts because I think she had <laughs> written or was about to write Death in the Clouds. Not to spoil mm. Death in the Clouds for anyone. <laughs> But you want to talk about wild Christy murders. Um, yeah, it, it, it's pulpy, right? Which one's your favorite? Uh, ooh, That's ooh. hard, I know. There's so many. I read Murder is Easy for the first time, I think, a couple years ago. And I 
loved it. Which one is that? It is about a guy who comes back from abroad. Like he's been a soldier abroad or something. (gasps) And he, yes, meets an old woman on the train and she dies. And he goes to the tiny town she's from to investigate her death. Um, And it's one of those ones that has a romance as one of the central plots. And I know Christy hated writing romances. She just did not want to do them. And yet she's so good at making couples. So mm-hmm. you know what? Answer me there, Dame Agatha. <laughs> I've only read the Aunt Agatha Christie novels with the major gimmicks that everyone talks about. Like, oh, oh yeah. well, I guess I won't list them because it's a total spoiler if you don't know. <laughs> but you probably know what I'm talking about. The list immediately comes to mind. Um, and if it didn't happen for you, go read some Agatha Christie's. <laughs> I, I suggested that at one point that we do one. <gasps> Yeah, well, uh, you know, we've got a few hundred books in our list of things we should do someday. So, <laughs> but yes, oh. uh, you were telling me beforehand that uh, you've also been listening to a lot of audiobooks, as, as I recall, right? Yes, I have. Um, and those are also murder mysteries, but not Agatha Christie. Um, I've been listening to the some Louise Penny murder mysteries. And I believe she's a Canadian author that somebody recommended to me on Twitter. And I listened to the fourth one first. It's it's about an inspector in the Quebec police force, a detective inspector. And most of the mysteries take place in this small town in the countryside in Quebec that is not even on a map. It's so tiny. And the first one that I read, which was the fourth one, I really loved because it has... A, this narrator whose voice like activates almost a synesthesia-esque response in me. It's just like so he has this deep, lovely voice that is very comforting. And the people that are in the book are very like the detective inspector, he's a very good moral person and he believes in the good in people, so it was kind of a comforting listen. And then when I listened to the second one, it was so ugh. it had elements of like ugh, fat phobia that I wasn't comfortable with and awkward racial moments and I was like I don't know what happened here because I've listened to more books in the series now and they're nothing like that and I it was very distressing to get through I was just like slogging through this second book in the series thinking what happened to your entire, I guess, what I felt was the moral center of this series. I don't understand what went wrong. So have you been listening to more crime fiction than usual now? And is it just a comfort reading or is there any, does it, does it work in any other way? Does it, does it feel appropriate for this moment? Let's say. Not in the, I'm not saying that judgily. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking refuge in crime fiction? Uh you know, I I don't know, and I've been thinking about it quite a bit, especially this past week, as there are so many conversations around police brutality, um, and I'm, I feel like part of what attracts me to Agatha Christie mysteries a lot is that the character is very seldom a police officer, they're a person, and sometimes the ways in which she contrives to give that person access to a professional investigation are ludicrous. And every time I love it because it's like, I see you cheating and I, I think you're brave. <laughs> <laughs> you're brave to understand that I don't want you wasting my time explaining a logical reason for this random guy to be led into a crime scene. I love this. I, I don't know. I feel like if I were to start reading another series with professional police officers in this moment, I would feel strange and need to examine that. But murder mysteries have always just been catnip to me ever since I was a kid. So reading, I I started reading the Christie's before I went into quarantine, but certainly there was no moment when the world got strange and I said, Oh, I better stop reading about death. No, I want to read about <laughs> It, I want to read about ludicrous individual personal deaths. I don't want to read about uh, the apocalypse. I, I have a question for you. Have you read the Hemingway piece in the New Yorker yet? <laughs> I was thinking of you when it came out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chris knows I was cramming it <laughs> before this call. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought we might talk about it. How'd you feel? 
I really liked it. Yeah, I know. I liked it and felt ashamed at the same time. It was really painful. Yeah, I read it literally 10 minutes ago. So please allow this opinion to come with <laughs> the shiny newness factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I appreciated how domestic it felt while at the same time there being that dark undercurrent of all cops are bastards that was happening in the outside world. Right. That was super interesting. <sighs> that was super interesting. I will not spoil it for Chris, but it's, it's worth reading. Yeah. It's a story that reminds you like, wow, he's a beautiful writer. Wow. He must've been a huge asshole. <laughs> you know, to oh, completely. It, but, oh my God. Ugh. I want to ask about your bullet journaling, your reading habits. You said that it got you to read a lot of children's books at one point or get up your numbers, but have there been any, are you analyzing it for other trends or is there anything else you're hoping to gain from that? Or is it just a fun thing to do? Oh, so I think I just started tracking books just to track books and putting a number on that because that's what people do when they track things. And I didn't think about using that data until this year when I looked at my list and thought, oh, 40 books, what a champion I am. Oh, <laughs> it's, it is the coronavirus infection graph, except Agatha Christie is the top, <laughs> is the peak, and I should flatten that curve. Because um, <laughs> I, I just realized, you know, her books are like candy. You can, as you said, Suzanne, you just devour them. So it's almost like equivalent to reading a children's book, honestly, um, at the speed I blast through them. Um, so that made me want to then do a genre breakdown as soon as I realized that I was reading so many Christie's. So I did end up doing a genre breakdown and then an author breakdown, which is where I found the horrible visual of <laughs> Agatha Christie Peak. And now that we are in this moment of waking up once again for the millionth time to white supremacy and just the lack of black representation in in media, I'm thinking I should probably do a gender and race author breakdown as well. Um, and it would be very disappointing, I think, looking just scanning this list. But I think it would be like when when you're confronted with that giant lack of perspective in the books you've been reading, I think it's a wake up call will hopefully be a wake up call for me. Certainly just looking, scanning down this list, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is the thing, right? Like, you know, the opportunity to sort of reflect and look at what you're reading, and what you're doing. I mean, it's invisible normally, right? Unless you do something like this bullet journaling and actually like look in the mirror, right? And think about it. Yeah. So that's a really good thing, I think. There are lots of black mystery writers mm. yeah i'm gonna get out there <laughs> i'm sure somebody has already put together a goodreads list for me to just uh, whoop. and in fact we found a reading list for simone of african-american mystery writers that was hosted by the los angeles public library which you'll find a link to in our show notes our fourth guest is Shama Boyarin, who is an assistant professor in the English department at the University of Victoria. He's also the director of the Religion, Culture, and Society program, and his research and teaching interests span medieval literature, with a specific focus on Hebrew and Arabic literature, as well as religion and pop culture. Hello, Shama. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? As I've been saying to everybody who asks, um, as well as can be expected, as you know, Chris and Suzanne, we literally live on an island, Vancouver Island. And I've been thinking more and more about, on the one hand, how under this pandemic and under the uh, political situation, things become very, very local, but also very, very global. From the medical perspective, just to give you an example, Vancouver Island hasn't had a confirmed case of COVID for over a month now which is even different from the rest of the province of British Columbia. So it feels very kind of specific what we're going through, but at the same time, obviously, between friends and family and just being part of the world, it's also very connected and we're, you know, we keep our eye out on what is happening to our family in California or to, you know, colleagues and friends in Toronto or stuff like that. Um, so it it really kind of drives home how local things are, but also how international and global and bigger things are. 
It's neat what you're saying about the global and the local. And I think I, I think that's so perceptive. A lot of us are feeling locally situated in ways that I don't remember feeling before. Um, part of it is obviously just enforced not traveling for a period of time. But, you know, a couple of us were talking about like, do we want to travel? Do we want to travel as much? You know, and and our local commitments, especially our local political commitments, are looming large in ways that's a bit different. So, for example, six months ago or a year ago, for me and I think for many of my friends, talking about political commitments often meant thinking at least nationally or regionally or globally. And now I find people are thinking about their towns and their cities and their neighborhoods. It's not that we're not also thinking on the bigger scale, but we're thinking about local change, local circumstance. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and both, I think, in a negative and in a positive way, uh, if I can tie it to your other question about the uh, political situation, about the protests and police violence um, and racism, maybe I'll begin with the n- kind of negative aspects of it. If we think, especially in Canada, if we think, oh, that's, you know, the stuff that's happening in in the South. Just yesterday, I was walking downtown in Chinatown and by the school there, the Chinese elementary school, they had signs up of support. Uh, you belong here. You're part of us. We love you. Now, those signs are a reaction to racist attacks against Chinese and Asian people in Victoria as a response to COVID. So we're not separate from that aspect. Also on Sunday, I went to a rally, a Black Lives Matter rally here in Victoria, and it was organized by UVic students. And uh, for the portion that I was there, there were people talking about their experience with anti-Black racism in Canada. And again, it just really made it palpable how this is not an issue that is, you know, just a a U.S. issue, even though kind of a lot of the unrest that we're seeing is coming from the U.S., but uh, it's definitely something that has local uh, aspects to it. But also people there were speaking about solidarity between the Black community and the Indigenous community over organizing and stuff like that. So if I... To turn it towards maybe a positive, there's also local elements of solidarity and and ways in which people organizing on the ground locally are also thinking about the specifics of where we live and how how we move forward together as a community. Yeah, like how we're grounded, each of us in our own places. And yeah, settling that right. Yeah, and how you know, and how issues about anti-blackness or police brutality are also issues that are shared by indigenous organizers and questions about uh, alternatives to the kind of police model that we have right now can also be articulated based on indigenous communal uh, histories and traditions. So there's all kinds of ways in which these things kind of reverberate and, and kind of connect the global or the international to the local. So has most of your recent reading been informed by these kinds of protests or are you also in doing pleasurable reading to you know keep your keep your spirits up etc Yeah no actually most of my reading to the extent that I am doing reading it has been kind of escapist reading still challenging intellectually but sort of things that you know when I need kind of a bit of a break from you know, the here and now. And also, as I think many of us, I'm, I'm finding it hard to sort of concentrate on one thing. So I'm also not doing very sustained reading. So I'm jumping around and reading currently kind of juggling three different things. So one thing I'm reading is a collection of short science fiction stories called The Trance Space Octopus Generation. Oh, wow. <laughs> Congregation? Congregation. Congregation. What did I say? You said I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, the author's name is Boki Takash, and they are uh, they were born in Hungary uh, and grew up mostly in Hungary, and then moved several places and now live in the U.S. And as the title kind of implies, it's it's speculative fiction. Uh, it comes from the perspective of a trans author. They are Jewish and they kind of bring in, not in every story, but in a number of the stories, uh, Jewish tradition and Jewish perspective in ways that I find really interesting. And it's short stories, so I can kind of 
you know, read a story, think about it, uh, put it down, and then kind of come back to the collection. I've been really uh, nursing it over a, a long time, even before this started, just because I'm enjoying it so much and I don't want it to end. And so that's one of the things I'm kind of been reading. That's so neat. You know, you're the second person who said to us that short stories are working really well in this present time. So that totally makes sense. And then um, like you, you were talking about kind of drawing out reading something that's pleasurable and comforting in some way. Uh, I've got a book that I've been reading that way for like months. It's um, Robin Ward Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. And I've been just like, I don't want it to end. So I'm just like rationing out, you know, half a chapter at a time. Yeah. Um, and it's really good because it's very serious. Some of the stories are heartbreakingly intense, but it's also because of its speculative nature kind of takes you to like places where alien octopuses are intelligent and, and talking to and negotiating worlds with human beings. And it weaves in quotations from the Talmud with hard science about nuclear waste and stuff like that. You know, each story kind of implies a whole imagined world that you can kind of, in in the short space of it, really kind of sink into. The other thing that I'm reading, and I just started it, basically it's a limited run comic series uh, centered around the vision. You know, he's one of the members of the Marvel superhero group called the Avengers, and he's an artificial creation. Uh, he has a artificial intelligent computer brain. And basically in the series, you know, it's this uh, recurring kind of trope in science fiction of trying to be human and trying to explore human relationships um, and things go horribly wrong. And then the third thing that I'm reading is unfortunately not available in English, although I hope that one day it will be. It's a Hebrew novel called Nehemiah, and the author's name is Yaakov or Jacob Meyer, and he's a scholar of early modern Jewish books and early modern book culture. And in his research for his PhD, let me back up a little bit. Um, it's set in the 18th century, during this period, uh, a figure named Shabtai Tzvi appeared in the Jewish world and kind of created this uh, messianic fervor and managed to convince a lot of the Jewish world that he was the Messiah. And he created this big movement and had support, and uh, he was traveling towards the Holy Land. And as you guys know, uh, the route from Europe to the Holy Land passes through Constantinople. So he had to go through uh, the Ottoman Empire. So on his way, he gets arrested by the uh, Muslim Sultan. He's in prison. And at some point, he is offered the option of either converting to Islam, renouncing his statement that he's the Messiah, or being executed. And he converts to Islam. And that's kind of the end of his story, more or less. Some of his followers continue to believe that he is the Messiah and that he only converted in order to proselytize amongst the Muslims. So that's kind of a historical fact. Now, this minor character, which we only know from very few references, uh, is this man named Nehemiah, who came from Poland, who met with him the night before he agreed to convert. Oh, wow. And we have very little details about him. And basically, uh, the novel kind of creates a whole story about this man, Nehemia, and kind of his travels till he meets Shabtai Tzvi and, and, and has a conversation with him. So uh, I don't know where it's going to go. I haven't read the whole thing, but, but it's kind of building up towards this kind of conclusion. Um, and it's really, really fascinating. Uh, he's populated it with a lot of really colorful Jewish characters, but there's a lot of interactions between this character, Nehemia, and various Christians, and, you know, a whole kind of early modern world is, is created in a Sounds very, amazing. Yeah. Um, I think it would be really, really interesting to a lot of readers. Yeah, it sounds terrific. I hope it gets translated. It would be a really, uh, really challenge to translate because Jacob really, I think, successfully kind of gives his characters a real kind of interesting Jewish voice. And uh, it would be interesting to see how somebody would manage to replicate that in, in English. You've told us about some incredibly exciting books, Shama. I'm very excited by them. Thanks. Um, um, I'm happy I could come on and talk a little bit about these things. 
So yes, Shama and indeed all of our guests gave us a lot of really interesting books to add to our ever-growing pile of books to read. <laughs> they know it's out of hand. Well, we'd like to thank all of our guests for being so generous with their time and for talking with us. It was really wonderful to catch up with them and to hear what they've been thinking about and what they've been reading. Yeah. Thank you, Carissa, Allison, Simone, and Shama. And of course, we'd always love to hear what you've been reading as well. So please get in touch with us. If there's anything interesting that's been on your radar, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 30B. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn.